In 16th century Europe, a massive economic shift occurred, which is known as the Commercial Revolution. And the short way to define this entire revolution is that money became the most desirable commodity in Europe and not land. But in order to understand the entirety of this shift and its effects, I need to tell you two stories and give you a list. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, now this is the Bank of Amsterdam, which was opened by the Dutch in 1609. It's kind of a big deal. Now, to us who live in the 21st century, a bank is patently not a big deal. You know, I mean, if you're like, like me, there's probably five banks within a mile of where you live. But before the 16th century, there were precisely no banks on this scale anywhere. So the question is, what was going on in the Netherlands and in the wider world of Europe that necessitated a new bank opening up? Well, the answer is that Europe was undergoing a massive economic shift into what's called a money economy. Now, a money economy is an economy in which goods and services and wages for work were paid with, you know, money. Prior to this, if you were a blacksmith and you wanted a new goat, for instance, because let's be honest, who doesn't want a new goat? now and then, you know what I'm saying? Then you would have to find a way to trade your services for that sweet goat of your dream. And as the economy became more globalized as a result of European imperialism, this barter system of trade became far too inefficient and cumbersome. So instead of trading services for goods or goods for other goods, a money economy arose in which people could now exchange money for what they wanted. And again, you're like, whatever, I do that all the time. But look, it was a big deal, okay? So with the rise of this new kind of money economy, banks became a practical necessity. So when you see this bank, you need to see through it a massively growing and changing economy. The European economy was changing so much that new institutions, which is to say, in this case, banks, were necessary to keep track of everybody's boom boom. I can see it in your eyes. You're wondering, how did they keep track of all that money? What a good question, my dear pupil. Since so much money was flowing in and out of the Bank of Amsterdam and other banking centers in Genoa and London, they developed what's called double-entry bookkeeping. The idea here is that all the debits went into one column and all the credits went into another. And the thing is, you know, you don't need to know the details of how double-entry bookkeeping worked. You just need to understand that the need for such a system meant that there were huge amounts of money flowing through these banks. And one of the major effects of the rise of banking centers is the shift of economic power in Europe to places like Amsterdam and Genoa and London. Now, what does this have to do with Dutch imperialism? A question you didn't know you needed to ask, but alas, you do. Well, as you already know, private investors created the Dutch East India Company in order to oversee their trade ventures in the Indian Ocean. This also was an innovation in finance. You know, the Dutch East India Company was what was known as a joint stock company, and all that means is that it was a private company, not a state-sponsored company. The idea here is that several investors pooled their money and bought shares in the company and therefore shared the risk of the Dutch East India Company's ventures, but they also shared in its success. And the truth is, there was much success to be had. The Dutch came to dominate trade in the Indian Ocean, and when all that profit came in, you know who handled it all? Anyone? Anyone? That's right, it's the Bank of Amsterdam. So the point is, this bank stands as a monument to the massive economic shifts toward a money economy in 16th century Europe. For the second story, let me introduce you to a mountain you've probably never heard of in a place you have likely never been. This is a mountain in the city of Potosi, which is located in what is now southern Bolivia and which was in the 16th century part of the Spanish Empire in the Americas. And the Spanish loved this mountain. And, you know, love is probably too weak a word. They they loved it. They loafed it. And they loved it so much that they drew it. They painted it. They sent postcards of it back to Spain. They positively fainted over this mountain. And it was this mountain that would change the face of the European economy for almost 150 years. So why did they love it so much? Because inside that mountain, they found metric buttloads of silver. And as that silver was sent back to Spain and flooded the European economy, it had a couple major effects. First, this influx of silver caused what's known as the price revolution, which is a phenomenon in which prices steadily rose for about a century and a half. Now, why would more silver cause prices to rise? Well, that's what we call inflation and think about if it. If people living in Spain all of a sudden had a bunch more money to spend, then what are they going to do? They're gonna buy a bunch of crap. Well, when the producers of that stuff realize that they're running short on goods, they're going to raise their prices so that their stocks aren't depleted so quickly. And that makes sense, right? But the problem is that all this new wealth was not equally distributed to everyone. So for all those people who weren't fortunate enough to get their hands on this new influx of silver, for them, the prices of goods they needed just rose and they had no money to pay for it. And while this started in Spain, the effects of the price revolution were felt throughout much of Europe as well. But we're talking about agriculture here, so what did the price revolution have to do with farming? Well, first you need to understand how farming had been done prior to this. So before the 16th century, most European agriculture was organized according to a system called feudalism. In this system, a king granted land to nobles who then employed peasants to work for the land. And these peasants' lives were oriented around the manor, which was the agricultural state under the nobles' control. And on those manors, the peasants engaged mainly in what's known as subsistence farming, which means they grew only what they needed to survive. Now, in that system, soil exhaustion was 
was a constant threat with which they contended. And so the solution they came up with was pretty brilliant, and that was crop rotation. In Mediterranean Europe, this took the form of the two-field system, which meant that half the land would be planted each season, while the other half would not be planted or, you know, lie fallow in order that the fallow land could replenish its nutrients for the next season. In Northern Europe, they had the three-field system, where they divided their land into three sections and then planted two each season and then let one lie fallow, which is to say two-thirds of the soil was productive each season. And that's how things went until the mountain and Potosi started spewing silver into the Spanish economy and making parts of the population fabulously wealthy. And that produced a big change in agriculture. Large landowners and capitalist investors began to see the open field system as wasteful and desired to increase available land so that crop yields would increase. For example, in England, legislation was passed to allow investors to purchase public land, which was land that everyone could use to graze their animals. And this was really important for peasants who couldn't afford land of their own. This became known as the enclosure movement, and it benefited the large landowners tremendously, but seriously disrupted the way of life of the peasantry and also, in many cases, increased their poverty. Regardless, power was now shifting to the banking elites and the landowners, and with this increasing influence of money, many places in Europe began to shift toward capitalism and away from mercantilism. Now, capitalism is an economic system in which the means of production are owned by private individuals as opposed to the state. And as capitalism made some Europeans rich, they decided to spend a lot of that money on land, which led directly to the commercialization of agriculture. The idea here is that land was now seen not as a way to subsist or to scratch out a living, but as a means to earn more money for the one who owned it. Now the stuff we grow or the sheep we shave is for profit, not survival. Now, as I mentioned, that created a great deal of hardship for the peasantry in these places, and that leads me to a list. The first effect of the commercial revolution was the rise of a new economic elite. For example, in France, you saw the rise of the nobles of the road. Remember that prior to this, titles of nobility were connected to land, and basically the only way you could become a noble was by being born into the family. But in France, these nobles of the robe were those who didn't have any nobility in their blood, but could afford to sort of, you know, buy their way into nobility. The second effect of the commercial revolution was the increasing freedom of serfs, which is to say peasants who worked the land. In feudal periods, serfs were basically bound to the land and lived at the pleasure of the nobility. But with the movement towards the commercialization of agriculture, many of these peasants were cut free of the feudal arrangement. Now, that wasn't necessarily a good thing in all cases, but I'll save that for the next point. Regardless, this increasing freedom for serfs was mainly a phenomenon in Western Europe, while in the East, serfdom became more entrenched. Over in the East, nobles clamped down on serfdom and even went so far as to restrict the rights of serfs in order to consolidate their power. This led, in many cases, to peasant revolts, but they were usually put down by the landed nobility. Now, the third effect of the commercial revolution was urban migration. Now that all these peasants are being cut free from the land, many of them migrated to cities looking for work. And as these migrants poured into the cities, they put strain on the city's resources. Old buildings were subdivided into small apartments and then crammed full of people, and those conditions caused deadly diseases like the plague and tuberculosis to spread rapidly. Additionally, with all these new people, there were not nearly enough jobs for everyone, and so urban poverty became a real problem. And finally, the fourth effect of the commercial revolution was a change in family patterns. After the Black Death, in which more than 20 million people died, Europe needed to repopulate, so the rate of marriage began to rise, and people were getting married younger as well. However, during the Little Ice Age, which began around 1300, the malnutrition and disease caused by the scarcity of food caused many in the agricultural class to have smaller families and to wait to become financially stable later in life before marrying. And there was also a decline in multi-generational households. As a result of late marriages, women had fewer childbearing years, more miscarriages and stillbirths, and higher rates of infant mortality. And click right here to grab my AP Euro Review Pack, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. If you need more help with Unit 1, then this playlist right here is the bee's knees, as nobody says. I'll see you in Unit 2. I'm Laurent.